This video is brought to you by Victory Coffee. Now with Saccharin. All the beliefs, habits, tastes, emotions, mental attitudes that characterize our time are really designed to sustain the mystique of the party and prevent the true nature of present-day society from being perceived. Like everything in Oceania, hope is controlled by the party for its own purposes. Hope is used strategically to make the people accept a world that could be so much better. That's another of the book's similarities with the world of today. I've spoken in another video about hope and how it's used to manipulate us. But let's start today by describing how hope works in 1984. See if you notice any more parallels with the real world. Let's start with the supposed war. The populace is taught to hope for victory in the war against East Asia or Eurasia, whichever is the enemy of the day. They're always hoping for good news, and zealous party members, especially children, always want to watch the hanging of foreign prisoners, or film of foreign civilians getting gunned down, or just to have the knowledge that an enemy was hurt and humiliated. Since reports on the war are frequent and broadcast to everyone, the people, or at least members of the party, are always on the edge of their seats, waiting for positive news from the front. They've learned nationalism. Citizens have been taught that the party represents them, so the war represents them. So gains in the war are gains for them, somehow. Every so often, their hope is rewarded with good news, but it might just as soon be crushed. Propaganda doesn't just create enemies and tell you to hate them. It also requires you to get angry and act on that anger. You hoped for good news, but those Eurasian or East Asian bastards, God, I hate them! So in Oceania, they have the two minutes hate and hate week, because Orwell isn't particularly subtle. And this kind of event focuses their anger and therefore their energy on an external enemy which in turn supports the current system as they turn to Big Brother for protection and leadership. Party members are supposed to hope for the destruction of their enemies. But how could their enemies ever be destroyed? Why would those enemies go anywhere? They're weapons of the party. We hear this complete party tool say something about Complete and final elimination of Goldsteinism. And it made me think of how some people want to eliminate crime or terrorism or drugs or some other abstract enemy of the state. The state makes you believe these vague ideas are deadly enemies that it needs ever greater power to deal with. So why would it ever get rid of those things? States have an incentive to prolong problems, so those problems can continue to grant the state legitimacy to keep expanding its power. Hoping for an end to crime would be to hope the state will retire one of its most useful excuses for controlling the population. Believing you could win a war on terror is to think the thousands or millions of people who have an interest in making you believe in the war will suddenly find their consciences and give up trying to deceive you. In our time, we have nationalism too, and it distracts us from the real enemy too. Like in 1984, we have demonstrations in favor of the system. Whether in favor of oppressive and racist policies, or to salute and thank people whose job is to oppress others, whether locally or abroad, or even to say everything is fine and you shouldn't be demonstrating. It's not that the state compels people to do any of these things. It's that the propaganda they consume gives them enemies and persuades them to mobilize against them. 
This kind of propaganda is necessary for the workings of the state, because all states need to provide their subjects with enemies and heroes who defend them against the enemy. That way, civilians in 1984 and all the strongest states throughout history stay divided against the rest of the world for arbitrary reasons like skin color and borders, and united in favor of their oppressors. So we have nationalism, and we have other ideas given to us by oppressors for their own purposes. We're taught to believe in progress, meaning we expect things to just get better over time. It might mean we view history as a slow but inevitable march toward freedom or democracy or improved living conditions. It might mean seeing technological development as largely positive. It might mean believing society's morals are always improving and racism will fade away with the coming generation. So of course people raised on the progress myth have learned to hope. Hope can be a kind of drug you take to forget you're sick and should be finding a cure. More of us could be on the front line in the fight against climate change, stopping the logging of old growth forests in Fairy Creek, to take one example of hundreds, but we might be hoping for a political solution or a technological solution. There isn't one. The closest thing we have to a solution is giving stewardship of the land back to indigenous people. Don't hope, help. The people of Oceania are daily informed of how much better various aspects of life are getting. Attention comrades, we have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over Oceania this morning there were irrepressible spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. Though the statistics are even more misleading and fabricated than the ones we hear. They too are taught to expect progress, and they too listen to news that tells them they're making it. Why would you want the system to be different when things keep getting better? But do they? In what way? And for who? And why is half the world still mired in poverty? One type of progress we're holding out for is scientific progress. Science in 1984 serves very specific purposes. The two aims of the party are to conquer the whole surface of the earth and to extinguish once and for all the possibility of independent thought. There are therefore two great problems which the party is concerned to solve. One is how to discover, against their will, what another human being is thinking, and the other is how to kill several hundred million people in a few seconds without giving warning beforehand. So making war and finding out what people are thinking. Under capitalism, the benefits of scientific progress go largely to corporations. They do some of their own research, of course, but a big chunk of it is taxpayer-funded and takes place in government or university research labs, and is then patented by some huge corporation. In the description I link to a book on the subject. In a fair society, we could design technology to help people, rather than spending billions researching new weapons, and the fruits of invention would be free. Under capitalism, where everything costs money because it's sold for profit, thousands of people have to choose between insulin and food. When the rich are given exclusive ownership of the benefits of science, that means they've taken them away from the rest of us. So it's unsurprising that, like in 1984, the results of the study of the mind are regularly used in making propaganda in news media, advertising, Hollywood and the White House, but also on social media, where people come to be convinced that 
climate change and COVID are hoaxes and the world is actually flat. In this modern world, the people in power know your motivations because they created them. And they use them to limit your imagination and trap you in debt so you have to work for them your whole life. But let's say you manage to break free of the power of propaganda one way or another. In 1984, our protagonist, Winston, is one of an unknown number of people not yet completely brainwashed. He wants to bring down Big Brother, but he doesn't know how, and in his time, there's no way to do it. In our time, it's a bit different. A lot of people find it frustrating when they first learn how to see systems of violence and oppression for what they are, because if the solution is to destroy them, it's an extremely daunting task. But it's not impossible. We're supposed to believe it is. There are cracks in the wall, though. Enough people pushing in the right direction can really make anything happen. We need a lot of education and building systems of dual power first, which if you don't know about, you can read in the other book I link to in the description. But in 1984, Winston has no chance of challenging the system. There are no cracks in the wall and no hammers to make cracks with. For example, Winston has no way of knowing how many others feel like him, so he can't seek them out. As a result, Winston does what many people do in a fruitless situation, and hopes. He hopes some abstract force will stop the party, like lust. Enjoying sex, like enjoying anything, is forbidden in Oceania. The sexual act successfully performed was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Winston imagines sex will destroy the party. Not merely the love of one person, but the animal instinct, the simple, undifferentiated desire. That was the force that would tear the party to pieces. But they can get you there too. The party had already turned sex into a patriotic duty that no pleasure was allowed to be derived from. We already know from religion it's possible to make the populace regard sex as something dirty to be discouraged. Why would lust tear the party to pieces? It's a bit like thinking a video like this will overthrow capitalism. But this is what people tell themselves when they hope. Winston believes truth will stop the party. He says freedom is the freedom to say 2 plus 2 equals 4, but the party doesn't even grant you the freedom to believe. Early in the book, Winston observes, nothing was your own except the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. But eventually he realizes even that part of you they can get to. They can see inside your brain and twist it around their fingers. They give you one way to think and train you not to deviate. Most people simply follow the system they live under because they don't know any better. Others see no point in defying it. They might persuade themselves their best hope lies in succumbing to the power of the system and accepting the propaganda on its face. They adapt their thinking to the acceptable range of thought and their action to what the system demands of them. That's what happens to Winston in the end, and it happens to millions of former idealists and revolutionaries as well. Some sell out, some just have families and they don't want them to get hurt, but a lot of them started off with stars in their eyes and ended up totally disillusioned. Either way, the system has got to them. Winston's hopes rise when he finds documentary evidence that the state lied and fabricated the past. He had one scrap of paper that contained a lie that any thinking person would have recognized as a lie, but he lets his hope run away with him. 
This was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys the geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms, if in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. Yeah, well, it couldn't. Julia, Winston's Juliet, challenges him on it. What could you have done with it, even if you had kept it? Not much, perhaps, but it was evidence. It might have planted a few doubts here and there, supposing that I dared to show it to anybody. I don't imagine that we can alter anything in our own lifetime, but one can imagine little knots of resistance springing up here and there, small groups of people banding themselves together and gradually growing and even leaving a few records behind so that the next generations can carry on where we leave off. What? You want to sow doubts among people who have perfected doublethink? You want pockets of resistance to emerge from divided and brainwashed people? Not gonna happen, comrade. Winston wonders whether his evidence would make any difference when we know from our time it wouldn't. It's easy to find examples of lies and conspiracies and so on, but people rarely do anything about them. Nothing changed when the WikiLeaks reveals came out, or when Edward Snowden proved we were being spied on, or when the Panama Papers and the Pandora Papers revealed that the rich, that rich people stash away tens of trillions of dollars. Proof means nothing if people are trained not to understand it or to think they can do nothing about it. If an, there's enough public outcry, there might be a trial and some jail time, so a few individuals get punished, but the system comes out stronger than ever. In the case of Winston's evidence, he built up his own hopes, and we'll come back to that again later. Equally importantly in 1984, however, is the hope put about by the thought police to bring out the thought criminals. Members of the party hope for victory in the war on whichever continent they're told they're at war with, and in the war on production or whatever martial metaphor there they use to get people excited about lowering their chocolate rations. They're not supposed to hope for the downfall of Big Brother, but if they do, they might be enticed by whisperings of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is said to be a group working in secret to bring down the party. Their leader is said to be Emmanuel Goldstein, the archenemy of the party and the target of the two minutes hate. Goldstein's the supposed author of a book that Winston gets his hands on that explains Ingsoc and how to stop it. But Goldstein, the Brotherhood, and the book turn out to be beacons of hope used to trap subversive moths like Winston. Oh, you want to join the Brotherhood? Follow me, right into the hands of the Thought Police. In Chapter 1, along with Winston, we meet O'Brien, a member of the Inner Party, whom Winston suspects is, like him, skeptical of the party, unorthodox, a thought criminal, and maybe even a member of the Brotherhood. He thinks this way because O'Brien once gave him a look that seemed to say, I know you're not orthodox, neither am I. However, O'Brien is not that guy. O'Brien uses Winston's hope against him. The look he gave Winston was bait. All it did was to keep alive in him the belief or hope that others beside himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumors of vast underground conspiracies were true after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. Winston then fits O'Brien into a dream he had, where someone said to him, We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. And he convinces himself it was O'Brien, and, moreover, evidence of O'Brien's unorthodoxy. O'Brien leads Winston down a path of thought crime and traps him. 
Winston makes a similar mistake in trusting Mr. Charrington, the owner of the little shop in the Prole District, who turns out to be a member of the Thought Police. He befriends Winston, fills him with hope for something better, and then dashes it. This situation is nothing new for our world. Undercover agents of police or business can be found in every city, infiltrating unions and movements, entrapping angry youths, gaining people's confidence, sowing division. A con can work if it offers a person something they want. If you need money, and for that matter, even if you don't, you might fall for a lie if it promises you more money. If you're a lonely, hetero man, a beautiful woman can bring you down. People can get taken advantage of when con artists appeal to their sense of generosity or guilt. And if what you want is revolution, you need comrades. So when someone appears to be a new comrade, you might embrace them. But you don't know if you can trust them. So practice security culture. If Winston had a very sharp mind and was not taken in by hope, he might have survived the last free mind until he died. But he lets his imagination run away from him, which seals his fate. If there is hope, it lies in the proles. The proles are the 85% of the population who are not indoctrinated into Ingsoc like members of the party. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism, which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty specific grievances. But if there was hope, it lay in the proles. Winston repeats this sentence to himself throughout the book, conditioning himself to believe. You had to cling on to that. When at his most hopeful, Winston sees the proles as people who had never learned to think, but who were storing up in their hearts and bellies and muscles the power that would one day overturn the world. If there was hope, it lay in the proles. Without having read to the end of the book, he knew that that must be Goldstein's final message. The future belonged to the proles. Why, though? Just because they're oppressed? If only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength. Right, if only this, if only that. We can fantasize all day. If only I were king of everything, then I'd put things right. In fact, Winston is repeatedly reminded the proles should not be a source of hope. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. Which sounds pretty familiar so far. That's what we call bread and circuses. It's common nowadays to point to popular obsessions with celebrities and athletes as part of the spectacle that distracts us from bigger issues, but regard politics as we know it as something it's important to follow and passively participate in. You might want to watch my video on why they're both part of the spectacle, and why what we call politics is itself the distraction. And why would Winston think Goldstein's final message would be to place your faith in the proles? In a different part of the book, he wrote, From the proletarians, nothing is to be feared. Left to themselves, they will continue from generation to generation, and from century to century, working, breeding, and dying, not only without any impulse to rebel, but without the power of grasping that the world could be other than it is. Yet Winston stubbornly maintains his hopes. I don't care. In the end, they will beat you. Sooner or later, they'll see you for what you are, and then they'll tear you to pieces. Do you see any evidence that this is happening? O'Brien replies. Or any reason why it should? No, I believe it. 
I know that you will fail. There's something in the universe, I don't know, some spirit, some principle, that you'll never overcome. Notice he doesn't really have an argument. That's what happens when you substitute belief for realism. Perhaps it's because deep down he knows the proles won't rise up, that Winston chooses to tell himself they will. He repeats it to himself every day like a prayer. It seems like doublethink, telling yourself what to believe regardless of the facts. He sees the proles fighting amongst themselves. He knows they're addicted to the minor pleasure of sports, alcohol, and the lottery. He knows they don't know how the world works and have no interest in learning. And he knows that there are spies of the thought police among them to eliminate firebrands. And yet, he puts his faith in them. Some of us have similar hopes. Things are getting better. Everything will be okay. Just have faith. We shall overcome. Truth will win. Good will triumph over evil. Love conquers all. You can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. The revolution is unstoppable, etc., etc. I've made a whole video about why I disagree and why we should stop hoping and start examining things much more critically in order to get a realistic perspective, rather than a hopeful one. Winston spends most of the book analyzing his situation, and whenever he reflects soberly, he realizes he's screwed. It's only when either dreaming or being tricked that he thinks there's some value to resisting. In our world, there's plenty of reason to believe we can attain a free and fair world, but there's nothing inevitable about it. It's a question of making it happen, and we don't have a lot of time. We need to wake people up and present them with organizations where they are empowered to make a difference. The poor want their economic emancipation now, not after the promised future revolution. We need to have a vision for the future, but equally fundamentally, we need to understand and act in the present. I think of hope this way. If I wanted to beat Manny Pacquiao in the ring, no amount of hoping or praying could possibly prepare me. And, and what about him? Do you think Manny would feel hopeful going up against me? <laughs> I think if he stepped into the ring with me, most likely his dominant feeling would be of amusement. He wouldn't need hope. As Swinza could have told me, and by the way, it's pronounced Swinza, the outcome would be decided before the fight even began. Sure, I could make it my goal to become a boxing champion, and that would be totally different from hoping, because then I would be putting a lot of effort into it. I would train every day, I would exercise and eat right and focus. I would also have to go back in time 20 years somehow, because I'm way too old now. At least then, I might have a chance of making it past the first few seconds after the bell. But unless I had committed that much effort into learning and training and knowing my opponent, why would I challenge him at all? No, if, if I wanted to beat Manny Pacquiao at something, I would challenge him to a game of StarCraft. I can beat him if I face him on my own terms. I don't need hope if I've got the right analysis and understanding of the situation, the right strategy, the right tools, the right people with the right skills, and so on. The same is true whether playing a game or overthrowing a government. That's one way knowledge can be power. In the book, Julia has a more realistic view than Winston. She experiences what Mark Fisher called capitalist realism, but 
for Ing Sock and Big Brother, so Ing Sock realism? Such a thing as an independent political movement was outside her imagination, and in any case, the party was invincible. It would always exist, it would always be the same. You could only rebel against it by secret disobedience, or, at most, by isolated acts of violence, such as killing somebody or blowing something up. She refuses to believe in the existence of the Brotherhood, saying it's a PSYOP, which turns out to be true. She presents the idea to Winston that the war isn't actually happening, and that the government bombs its own people to keep them hating the enemy in order to stay loyal to the state. Julia has adapted better than Winston to secrecy. If you kept the small rules, you could break the big ones and has relevant skills, such as talking without moving her lips. Her memory for propaganda was more fallible than Winston's. She did not remember that Oceania, four years ago, had been at war with East Asia and at peace with Eurasia. It was true that she regarded the whole war as a sham, but apparently she had not even noticed that the name of the enemy had changed. I thought we'd always been at war with Eurasia, she said vaguely. But she knows it doesn't matter, because most people are not persuaded by evidence anyway. In their world, organized resistance is futile, so Julia just breaks the rules as best she can. If most people broke the rules like her, there might be a chance of stopping the system. But as probably everyone around her is brainwashed, she can really only do small things to her own advantage, like stealing stuff from inner party members. Our tastes, desires, goals, and everything we think is normal come from a system designed to limit us. Our imaginations, what we think is possible, are restricted to what the system expects of us and what the propaganda suggests to us. We dream of having a house so big it has an echo, or a car that goes faster than we're ever going to go or diamonds, so we can ostentatiously talk about how married we are. So we keep working, hopefully, and patiently. We don't even consider trying to end the system that forces us to work. We're like Julia, thinking of freedom as merely evading an authority, rather than not having to answer to one. But we don't have to get our dreams from commercials. In our time, the system looks indestructible too, but it isn't. For one thing, not everyone is completely indoctrinated. Some people seek the truth, or at least listen, and they might be persuaded to see their oppression for what it is and stand up against it. And of course, millions of people already do. We can speak out and find others who want to change things. We can learn how the system works and exploit its weaknesses. It's not that there's no hope in our time. It's that we should be sufficiently organized and prepared that we don't need hope. Less hope and faith, more Swinz's art of war. Thanks.